My name is Alex of the Corporate Cowboys Podcast. Thank you for joining me as I read to you Chapter 2 of Stuck. How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss by Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh. Publisher is Productivity Press, 2022. With some commentary. I'll be providing commentary every now and then. If I really get inspired and hyped up, you'll hear about it. On to chapter two. The brain's journey is our journey. A couple of quotes. In all social species that have been observed, it is clear that the group possesses a protective function for the individuals that comprise it. It is thus reasonable to believe that there is some basic behavioral system that has evolved in social species that leads individuals to seek and maintain proximity to a group of conspecifics by Mary Ainsworth. Another, today, humanity is like a waking dreamer caught between the fantasies of sleep and the chaos of the real. We have created a Star Wars civilization with Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. That's by E. O. Wilson. <clears throat> Madeline is the senior vice president for sales and strategy for the Midwest region of a nationwide insurance carrier. She has a great track record of collaborating with partners to drive sales and a 10 year history of hitting the annual target of five to 7% growth expected by her leadership team. Madeline's approach stems from her long-term relationships with channel provide channel partners that help her leverage relationships with larger organizations to drive sales, resulting in the highest sales in her division. She builds relationships over 9 to 12 months to strike a deal with a channel partner that will increase sales by 1% in the next year. As 2019 started, Madeline was coming off the best year of her career. She just hit 10% growth, and she had channel partners lined up to yield another 8%, exactly on track with corporate expectations. At the end of quarter one, at the leadership team meeting, the national sales president noted that sales were lagging across the country and that the team may need to think about strategies to improve sales by the end of the year. Madeline wasn't seeing the same trends. She was still on target and she saw nothing to slow her down. All she had to do was stay the course. Madeline came to the, to the Q2 leadership, that's the second quarter, the second quarter leadership meeting proud of her success. She was ahead of plan because one of the channel partners she expected to join in, th in the third quarter unexpectedly started early, but she heard a different tone at the meeting. Again, the national sales president expressed concern, but this time he also adjusted targets for the regions that were doing well. Instead of 8% growth, Madeline would need to hit the 10% growth she found in 2018. Additionally, Madeline's success with channel partners was highlighted and the national sales president asked Madeline if she could use any of her channel relationships to drive sales in other regions. I mean, if I was in Madeline's position, I would say, yes, obviously I can, because if I have a proven track record, that means that I've got a technique, a strategy, a process that not others are using. I mean, I could also be sitting in a more trafficked, more populated, more metropolitan region, right? But uh, I definitely would want to get compensated. If I'm going to be pulling strings in other people's backyards, I want to be compensated appropriately. By the end of the third quarter meeting, the situation was dire. 
Madeline's peers were deeply behind plan. Every other region was missing their targets. Madeline was still hitting her 8% target for growth, but saw no way to hit a 10% target. While she tried to have her channel partners support sales in other regions, it was mostly met with resistance. It turns out that her channel partners were aligned by region 2, and they had little incentive to support the growth of other regions. In the middle of the fourth quarter, the national sales president called the meeting. The company was being sold to a competitor. The low production across the board was a sign that the company could no longer compete. Most of the sales team would be considered duplicative, but the but the acquire hold up. Most of the sales team would be considered duplicative. But the acquiring company had minimal presence in the Midwest. The national sales president told Madeline the acquirer was quite excited to meet Madeline to see how she could help them build their presence. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like you'd be you'd be training somebody to take over your position. It sounds like you're it sounds like you're training yourself out of your position. Which, I mean, shit, if you're going to be taking on a training role and you know that you're headed for the door, I say you squeeze them. Squeeze them for a, a training fee, some kind of consultancy fee. Don't settle for a severance package. Fuck all that. Madeline's story, I mean, you could still, you could probably even stay on as a consultant, as a training consultant. Anyways, Madeline's story is common, but there is also the story of our brain. The human brain has been slowly moving down an evolutionary path for millennia. Our brain set a singular target, survival, and drove toward that target from the beginning of time. The brain evolved to meet the demands of other functions in society, but only so far as it serves this central goal of survival. We all know the story of the tortoise and the hare. The tortoise slowly plods along in the race while the hare speeds ahead only to take a rest and he wakes up to find out the tortoise crossing the finish line in the end. This is how organizations behave with the brains of their employees. <laughs> Word. Yo. <laughs> I did not expect that next sentence right there. <laughs> okay. All right. You know what? I'm liking this book. I'm liking this book. It's not sucking corporate dick, but at the same time, it's, it's uh, checking corporate. You know what I mean? It's putting... It's putting the horns on corporate. It's putting the dunce cap on corporate for just a sec. You know what I mean? Everybody takes a turn with the cap. Organizations speed along expecting to beat the brains of employees to the finish line, but the brain slowly plods along and wins every time. What do we mean by win? Organizations can't move faster than the brain. I've been seeing this. An organization can't move faster than an individual. So if an organization wants to continue keeping you under their thumb and, and train your replacement, fuck all that. Just cut ties. Cut ties and charge them a training fee. You be the consultant. You be the independent contractor and negotiate your worth. In fact, an organization that needs people to progress can't move forward faster than the slowest critical brain. The brain's singular purpose remains to help one individual navigate the world for survival. We have oversimplified the brain in our organizations to talk about rational behavior and emotional behavior. In reality, the brain is a complex web of filters and blurred processes where the rational brain is filtered by perception and intuition and the emotional brain is blurred by history and nurturing. Within this complex web exists an intuitive brain that is the source of our memory, emotions, and learning. And here is where we get stuck. In this chapter, we, were, we will explore what does evolution teach us about the brain and how its functions developed? How do rational and emotional functions work in the brain? What does modern research tell us about the brain? How does the brain get stuck? How can I begin to assess my own brain and my rational and emotional challenges?
Our evolution led to the brain we have. Our organizations attempt to evolve at a blistering pace, but we are stuck with a brain that has evolved at a glacial pace. That's slow, moving like a glacier. When you think of human evolution, you undoubtedly get the visual of the monkey evolving to the modern man. The first steps in that path were the early primates who began their move from crawl to walk about 22 million years ago. Many of the critical traits that support human development happened over the next 20 million years as these ancestors evolved into the early homo species we think of today. These early humans used their brain power for one thing, survival. Around 2 million years ago, three homo species emerged with noticeably larger brains. Yeah, I added that in there, noticeably larger brains, because it just says with noticeable larger brains. It's noticeably. As our brains enlarged, the brain required more energy. The energy could not be attained by a plant-based diet, which led, for, which led to the need for more protein. The energy could not be attained by a plant-based diet, which led to the need for more protein. These species became dependent on animals for both the protein to drive increased brain energy and the amino acids to support brain development. Of course, an individual could not simply gather enough food for oneself for a long period of time, so the notion of cooperation developed. Evolutionary speaking, humans did not have physical advantages. We had minimal biological defensive characteristics, and we were not able to overpower most of the prey we sought. However, we did have cleverness and, more importantly, the means to work with others that allowed us to collaborate and cooperate toward a shared purpose. That shared purpose was initially the hunt and survival, but evolved over time into more robust endeavors. The brain required more energy to fuel its development into a more complex biological instrument. The human brain evolved with three distinct components or layers that track the evolutionary path, the reptilian brain, the mammalian brain, and the cortical brain. The reptilian brain is often described as the habit-forming part of the brain that focuses on our basic Maslowian, Mas Maslowian, Maslowian? Maslowian needs like thirst, hunger, sexuality, and shelter. The physical structure here is the basal ganglia. As we evolved, we developed the mammalian brain, which brings in the functions of memory and learning. This sits directly between the other two parts of the brain. As we will see in, the, in a moment, there is more at play here, but for now, this simple definition will do. In the third area of the brain, we find the bulk of the brain's mass, the part that needed to be fed with all that protein, called the cortical brain. The cerebral cortex represents more than 40% of the mass of the brain and is where the central nervous system comes to a head, pun intended. I guess that is pretty funny. It is within the mass of nerves that attention, perception, awareness, thought, language, and indeed consciousness itself all come to life. All, it says here, all come life. All come to life. It is in this third area of the brain where human society as we think of it and the workplace as we know it started to emerge. As the larger cortical brain developed, our meat-eating ancestors had both the biological need to collaborate and the biological capacity to collaborate. Their growing cortical capacity allowed for the development of social interactions, more complex hunting strategies and communication skills. While collaboration began for the hunt, it quickly spread into a host of other activities to support social development. Some individuals began to focus on hunting, while others would focus on protecting the children. Instead of chasing the animals, these early species would begin to build more permanent campsites. 
over time, some members of the group would hunt and some would farm. In modern shorthand, we start to see division of labor and specialization of work that further supported the advancement of the society. In the development of these distinct roles, many of these early humans undoubtedly started to develop routines. The reptilian brain focuses on base survival, but the mammalian brain focuses on learning and memory. I got those backwards. It says here focuses on memory and learning, but that's my bad. It is in this space that it, it, it is in this space of the brain where our earliest ancestors started to build basic routines and habits. As Sean Ocker notes, humans are biologically prone to habit, and it is because we are mere bundles of habits that we are able to automatically perform many of our daily tasks. These early ancestors became defined by their roles and what they did in their society. Additionally, the more advanced brain led to more advanced social interactions. With each new cortical connection, new human connections were also formed, and this ability became a critical part of success in emerging societies. Connections to other people became central to the survival of each person and to the people around them. As John Balby notes, humans are an instinct. Sorry. As John Balby notes, humans are by instinct a group animal. To survive, earliest mankind was equipped with attachment systems that provide effective protection, and this group living arrangement provides that function. All of these functions were supported by a slowly advancing brain that evolved over nearly 22 million years from a primitive state focused on thirst and hunger to, <laughs> to, to one that could specialize and strategize, communicate, and collaborate. The primitive state of thirst. <laughs> Shit, welcome to 2022, right? But this took 22 million years of evolution and many potential candidates for the evolutionary front runner fail for the evol what what failed along the but this took 22 million years of evolution and many potential candidates for the evolutionary front runner failed along the journey therefore we cannot breeze through these few paragraphs and expect the journey to extend indefinitely in our lifetime no we need to acknowledge the impressive progress of the brain but ultimately we need to take the brain as it is today we come to work with the brain we have. The brain developed through evolution in three parts, reptilian, mammalian, and cortical. But it is often studied via 14 anatomical features or functions. These include functions like smell, hearing, speech formation, vision, voluntary movement, and so on. In the workplace, we tend to ignore both constructs to talk about the brain with two main components, the rational brain and the emotional brain. In colloquial terms, we tend to speak of the rational side as working through life with logic, order, and reason. The other version is the emotional side, where we react out of feeling and sentiment. This dichotomy is flawed. There are truly three parts of the brain. In the 1950s, the American neurologist Paul Mac MacLean Paul MacLean coined the term triune brain that closely mirrors the evolutionary path. He describes the reptilian, the instinctive brain, the mammalian, emotional brain, and the cortical, human, rational brain. However, over time, we have learned much more about the mammalian brain and to label it as the emotional brain does the systems of our brain a disservice. It is truly an intuitive brain, as we will show, that brings together much more power and challenge to the workplace. Intuition resides in the limbic system of the brain, where the learning processes and memory are located, are co-located with emotion. Sorry, 
co-located with emotion. This makes sense because intuitive processes are developed through learned behavior. The limbic system resides between the cortical and reptilian brains working between the two to store information into implicit memory from the intensive processing of rationality and moving associations closer to the survival instincts of our reptilian brains. It is this intuitive brain that drives the positive and negative nature of our stickiness. A critical part of the limbic system is the hippocampus. The hippocampus supports an important type of neuroplasticity, which is when our brain's neural networks change and adjust. adjust yeah. In particular, we experience a type of neuroplasticity called long-term potentiation. That's LTP. Long-term potentiation occurs when we convert short-term memories into long-term memories. For many who study habit formation, the hippocampus is the key to turning a desire to take on a new behavior into the intuitive process of doing the new behavior. As we will see, the three-part brain is not a set of unique components of a computer sending data from one system to another. Instead, it is a complex set of systems working together, but ultimately blurred by learned memory and emotion. As these systems interact, the intuitive brain is simultaneously relying on memory, emotions, and associations while trying to learn in the current space. What sits between all of this emotion and rationality is attachment that supports our learning and growth, but also becomes the key to understanding why people get stuck. The Rational Brain we tend to think of our rational brain as the thinking part of the brain where we make decisions based on data and logic. The reasoning part of the brain is where we make trade-offs and decisions with logic and reason. The decision-making elements of the cortical network reside in the prefrontal cortex. These are the elements of the brain that focus on judgment, personality, and voluntary movement. Reasoning is inherently a slow process whereby our brain must process information and must bring this information together through a series of processes to compare this information against each other in order to decide. Basic economics provides us with the pure version of how the rational brain works. It is a trade-off for a rational actor. Economics describes the rational actor as one with a set of preferences that will act on these preferences to make the necessary trade-offs and get what is most advantageous for that actor. A simple example happens at the grocery store. Imagine yourself in the cereal aisle making a decision about cereal for yourself. You list your objectives for your purchase. Of course, you need a certain amount of energy for that big brain you are carrying around. You may want to minimize sugar to watch your waistline and max or maximize it to hide the taste of things that are good for you. And you might be thinking about cost. The rational actor would take each box and calculate the best cereal to meet the objectives you laid out on some sort of metric like calories per penny. That's pretty fucking deep. I don't know too many people that go to the store and calculate calories per penny. I don't, I don't know too many people that go to the store and... and uh, calculate a certain amount of energy for that big brain they are carrying around and then wanting to minimize the sugar to watch their waistline or maximize the sugar to hide the taste of things that are good for them. I mean, usually it's just the last factor. It's just the cost. It's usually they just think about cost. But, uh, I mean, calories per penny? No, no, not that type of cost. That is a whole new level of thinking for, for some individuals. Anyways, of course, we don't see people sitting at the cereal aisle with calculators. Isn't that what they just said people do? They grab a box and go. Oh, well, yeah, okay, most people. That's because the reasoning side of the brain uses filters, uses filters to make the processes move much faster. 
1957, the economist Herb Simon introduced the concept of bounded rationality. Simon argues that we choose from a set of limited options based on limited information with limited preferences. Simon also notes that the limited human mental capacity requires us to limit our choices. Sticking with our serial example, one of the important variables in the reasoning process is time. Our brain lacks the ability to calculate the cost per calorie of each cereal in the time it would take to make the decision about which cereal to purchase. I feel like it's a, it's like a, a negative feedback though. I mean, wouldn't you take the time to calculate in order to make the decision? Here they're saying that the shortcut is just making the decision, is just buying the cereal and not calculating it. Uh, therefore, our reasoning has some bounds to it, and we use other filters to make our decision. Maybe it is relying on known brands, trusted flavors, or simply colorful boxes. Ah, okay, it's a saying, people are retarded. Gotcha. <laughs> the intuitive brain's role in reasoning. This is where the intuitive brain steps into the role of the rational brain. Unlike the reasoning part of the brain, the intuitive part of the brain is fast. It does not require, it, it, it is, it is, does what? It is, does not requiring the process, the processing of information. It does not require, it is not, it does not require the processing of information. There you go. It, damn, this I mean, it's a 2022 book. Maybe the second edition will have less fuck-ups in it. It does not require the processing of information. Instead, it simply reacts in a seamlessly automatic fashion to its surroundings. The most common example we use of intuitive processes tend to be riding a bike, quote-unquote. Despite the fact this requires our brain to coordinate many tasks and functions simultaneously, it is so commonly referred to as the example of the intuitive skill coming back to us. Maybe it's not as simple as riding a bike. Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky deeply explored intuition through their lifetime of Nobel Prize winning work on intuition and the psychological factors that contribute to our behavior in the economy. Their work demonstrates how the mind impacts our choices and leads us to make judgments. They argue that our brain develops ways of navigating the world around us by limiting, shaping, and scoping information to make the vast amounts of it manageable and still be able to make reasonable decisions. That's seen in figure 2.1. These tasks or activities that we learn to do without even thinking become intuitive and no longer require the rational reasoning. In the workplace, these intuitive activities happen on a regular basis, depending on where our work resides in the economic spectrum. These intuitive activities may be the core of your work. A manufacturing job or an administrative processing role may need you to complete the same activity repeatedly every day as an intuitive task. Many in the knowledge economy may have a job description that seemingly has no intuitive activities. However, large organizations often require a set of administrative functions that become intuitive to the members of that organization, similar to our earliest ancestors and their understanding of roles in the hunting and gathering process. These learned functions become intuitive tasks even in what may seem to be a critical thinking role. Just real quick as a side note, figure 2.1, let's go back up. 2.1 seems to be like some sort of uh, chart, graph. It's graphing the three cognitive systems of perception, intuition, and reasoning. And uh, if, if you will, there's going to be like a running header at the top. Seems looks kind of like a flow chart. I'm just describing it for you. I'm doing my best to describe it. I'll take no more than a minute. 
It's uh, got percepti- perception, intuition, and reasoning along the top, and then two categories along the side. It's content and process. They're connected. Uh, content and process are connected horizontally to the boxes uh, inside, to the categories inside, and then perception, intuition, and reasoning are connected vertically going down. Perception and intuition are, are connected together into one box. That's it just lists characteristics. It's a parallel, fast, slow learning, automatic. And then the last box, reasoning, is connected to one box going down. It says flexible, slow, controlled, effortful, rule-governed, serial, and neutral. And then those are, are, are pretty much threaded through with the box from the left that says process. The second box on the left that says content, are th- uh, they thread through a box that's connected to perception at the bottom. And this one says percepts, stimulus bound, and current stimulation. And then uh, content also threads through a box that is linked to both intuition and reasoning from the top. And that's going to be in that bottom corner. Intuition and reasoning are linked into this one box that's threaded through content. And that says conceptual representations, past, present, and future, and can be evoked by language. All right. Back to the reading. Another critical filter in the reasoning process are mental models. Mental models serve as an internal algorithm or schema for how to handle the world around us. Mental models are an example of the intuitive cognitive process that help filter and sort information. These not only support decision decision making like our trivial serial example, but also everyday navigation of the world for survival. Frost on the lawn means it is cold, get a jacket. There is a puddle in the road that could be deep, slow down. Mental models are rarely built on single attributes, but rather a set of attributes combined to create our understanding of a situation, like a complex mathematical algorithm. That makes sense. I mean, just seeing a puddle on the ground, you don't automatically think it's, uh, it's, it's deep. I mean, you contextualize it in your experience, having driven the road up until that puddle or whether you know, whether you already know a hole exists below that puddle that is deep, and so the puddle is deep, making it a deep puddle kind of thing. That makes sense. Many of the different attributes we learn to identify fall into binary pairs like light, dark, safe, unsafe, or weak, strong. It is not the single pairs that make the mental models. It is the combinations of pairs that really demonstrate the strength of the human brain. For example, when we are watching a horror movie and we suddenly get the sense that something terrible is going to happen, that sense does not come from rationally examining the examining that sense does not come from rationally examining the plot of the film. It is because we have been trained to understand that the combination of a dark alley with eerie music a blowing wind, and a protagonist walking alone may lead to danger. It is the interaction of signals that create the mental model. The same is true within organizations where we use mental models to interact with customers and coworkers and make decisions. Unlike the intuitive tasks that are the formal roles of the job, the mental models of the workplace are how to navigate the role or organization. For example, a person may be taught the functional steps to be a sales clerk, but that will not suffice for how to work with customers. The employee will also need to learn how to read people in the context of the store environment. Is the customer happy with the service of the store or disappointed? Is the customer struggling to understand the cost? Is the customer struggling to understand the employee? Mental models emerge for these situations as the brain starts to understand how to work within the situation. 
Mental models extend to interactions with coworkers. We use mental models to learn how to identify extroverts and introverts, to identify skill sets and strengths in other people, and to understand how we will build our own response to others. Mental models are critical functions that help us navigate an organization. Simply think of titles. When a soldier hears the rank of a commanding officer in the military, or an employee sees a title like chief technology officer, they intuitively know the importance of the person. There is an important distinction to make here, especially when talking about people. Mental models are not stereotyping, but may be, may be a precursor to stereotypes from a biological perspective. We are not talking about how to proliferate negative or systematic beliefs about groups of individuals. Mental models are the shortcuts our brains will use to manage the vast amounts of information available to us in the world. Stereotyping is a possible negative downside of mental models that individuals and leaders must avoid. Our brains are wired to find shortcuts and as we interact with employees and organizations, we have the responsibility to avoid proliferating broad concepts that others can potentially catalog as a mental model to discriminate against others. A uh, quick side note, I kind of agree and disagree. I think it's just fine to stereotype, uh, but I think this this book or just this paragraph here really hypes up the negativity of, of stereotype. Notice how it says here, um, we are not talking about how to proliferate negative or systematic beliefs, but at no point does it say uh, negative or positive, positive or, ne or negative. It, it doesn't give that binary. That, that, it doesn't say negative or positive. It just says negative or systematic and uh, leaving systematic kind of vague, kind of implying that there may be some positivity there, but all in all, systematic isn't negative. They were trying to use the word systematic to uh, to embellish negative, to, to bolster the negativity of stereotyping via mental models. But I think, hey, if you can stereotype somebody and then find a way to use that stereotype to make business happen, to facilitate economic interactions, Yo, more power to you. But I mean, yeah, if you're using mental models to discriminate, to just outright discriminate, to just strike through a, a, a potential prospect for business, I mean, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. You know, do, do what thou wilt. And if you fuck up, I'll be there to catch you lacking. How about that? Mental models also impact or corporate cowboys. It won't even be me. A corporate cowboy will be there to catch you lacking. How about that? Mental models also impact the decision-making processes in organizations. Just as we develop models for people, we develop analogs for situations. These analogs are helpful to speed decision-making. It is as if the brain knows it has seen the situation before and it is applying the same principles it applied the last time to this decision. For example, when deciding where to place a new location, the vice president of operations for a growing retail workout apparel chain will likely look at the customers in recent locations and try to find locations with similar demographics, square footage, and a similar environment. What if there is a factor that is not revealed by this methodology? What if growth in the past three stores was enabled by social media influencers in the same location? How would that data get introduced into the decision-making framework? There are many common mental models we employ in our organizations. We tend to combine them with processes to help us implement the model. For example, in budgeting, we often claim we are building a return on investment budget but we really take last year's budget and add to it through a mental model of incrementalism. We often bring models around trade-offs. We tend to discount certain factors based on what we believe about the future, which can lead to either optimistically developing financial outlooks 
for the future or developing more pessimistic views. No matter how these are deployed, the mental models become almost a filter over our decision-making processes that can shape the information we review, but also can limit our information review. Emotional brain. The emotional brain is defined as the reactive state whereby emotions govern the behavior of individuals. The reality of emotion is much more complicated than that. The emotional brain is a part of the brain responsible is the part of the brain responsible for interpreting signals from the vast environment around the body using all the available sensors eyes, ears, mouth, nose, skin, and associating these sensations with past experiences and anatomical functions to understand what type of response the body should provide to the situation. As James Grady outlines, the simple act of reading one's facial expression to understand our own response is a complicated process. The information of the other person's facial expression must move through a lattice of facial recognition networks related to recognition of the meaning of various expressions in our reptilian brain to determine whether the other person is a threat. This basic function supports survival before a response is considered. Then a secondary function can be activated in the cortex to determine, once safety is assured, the appropriate response. These emotional signals get categorized by the brain into a set of emotional processes. This is the point when all of the understanding of expressions and environment and environment pivots on to response. Pivots to response. This is the point when all of the understanding of expressions and the environment pivots to response. Estonian neuroscientist Jacques Panskip devoted his life's work to studying the brain's reaction to the environment to understand emotions. His research started by looking at the emotional brains of animals via MRI scans, and he was able to evolve this research into solutions for the human brains that might be struggling with some sort of addiction or loss. Through his years of research, he isolated our emotional processes into seven primal emotional systems. This is in, in table 2.1. These are the core emotions that sit at the root of our responses and Pankeep studied these to understand how brains behave when each of these emotions were activated. All of these emotions are necessary roles in our lives. They also have negative sides that can create challenges in organizations or workplaces and extremes that can create personal challenges for individuals. And uh, looking at table 2.1 real quick, just going back up here, it's titled Executive Emotional Systems. And in parentheses, it says traditionally all in caps, traditionally all in caps. I don't understand what that means, all in caps. Oh, traditionally. The, the ones that are all in caps are the traditional ones. And yes, there are four columns. The first one on the far left says system, and it lists uh, emotional systems. The second one, the second column is effective description. The third column is negatives, and the fourth column is extreme. So if we're going by columns, and you would like to notate these down on a piece of paper, I'll, I will list them off for you, and then you make the uh, you make the appropriate positioning in on your piece of paper as far as the columns and rows go. Under system, there is an all caps in all caps. There is seeking, rage, fear, lust, care, panic, and play. And then under affective description, there is enthusiasm and motivation, anger and irritability, worry and concern, erotic feeling, 
tender and loving, lonely and sad, and then joyous. Under the column titled negatives, there is frustration, contempt, anxious, jealousy, romantic attachment, guilt and shame, and then overactive. And then extreme, under the column titled extreme, there is obsessive compulsive addiction, aggression, phobias, psychic trauma, PTSD, those three are under or would be listed with fear. Uh, for lust, there would be fetishes, then dependency disorders, then depression, then ADHD. All right, returning to reading. And this is a subsection called The Intuitive Brain's Rule in Emotions. Unfortunately for us, the emotional systems do not seem to be treated equally by our brains. There is a hierarchy that exists and some of it is intuitive. Our most basic primitive emotional responses of fear, rage, and lust reside in the reptilian brain where the brain does not temper reactions but just reacts. The other four emotional systems of seeking, care, panic, and play that all have a more social element reside in the limbic system. These are tempered and influenced by our other associations and memories. Note that none of these emotion systems reside in the cortical brain. Our rational brain, with its logic and reason, cannot control emotions. It does not control response. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I fucked that one up. Our rational brain, with its logic and reason, cannot control emotions. It does control response. So the brain can learn to temper these emotions, but all the strength and power of the meat-fed cortical brain can only dampen the impact of our core emotional systems. These systems are reactions that formed biologically based on the brain. Our three primitive emotional systems are fear, rage, and lust existing in the reptilian brain are more hardwired based on nature. However, the other four systems are clearly connected to nurture. Our social emotional systems exist in the limbic system. This is critically important because the limbic system is the place where memory, emotions, and learning come together in the brain. Our social emotional systems of seeking, caring, panic, and play are necessarily informed by the events of our lives and the associations we bring from these events. From an early age, these four systems are engaged by the people around us, parents, family members, and caretakers. The way in which these individuals engage our social emotional systems will determine how we develop them. Effective early parenting and caretaking will lead to seeking systems that are enthusiastic, care systems that are tender and loving, panic systems that are calm, and play systems that are joyful and measured. On the outside, this will look like a parent who is supporting a child with effective skills and social development. Within this child's limbic system, the brain will be learning what are good versions of each of these systems, storing that information in the memory and associating certain sights, sounds, and anatomical response to these emotions. These will be stored for life. We should repeat, these will be stored for life. How the intuitive brain gets stuck. Our intuitive brain, our limbic system, supports both our reasoning and emotional functions. It is a force on its own. It is also the source of our attachments. Attachments are the tangible and intangible objects we lean on for support as we navigate the world. Attachments form, a, form as a learned experience that is attachments form as a learned experience that is a combination of memory and emotion. In this way, they are incredibly powerful because they work in the limbic system where all the social emotional functions reside. Therefore, they are inherently connected to emotions about social interactions and feelings around seeking, care, panic, and play. 
In chapter 3, we will explain more about how attachment works. Here, we want to complete the explanation of how our intuitive brain can go from an asset to an impediment. For the rational brain, the challenge often comes from decision making. Our intuitive brain holds our memory and associative capacities. These, this is where our mental models fit. They, we, I'm fucking that up, hold up. This is where our mental models fit. We are building cognitive mental models about the world based on our experience. These models are necessary for survival. They help us navigate and simplify the world around us. In the workplace, we regularly use mental models to inform our decision making. As mentioned above, we use analogs to sort information and speed our way to a decision. But what happens if we repeatedly use the same analog despite the circumstances changing? In their famous study of historical analogs, thinking in time, Richard Neustadt and Ernest May demonstrate the disastrous consequences of historical examples of failed attempts to apply past analogies to current thinking. It is not that we should avoid making analogies to the past, but that we should be careful not to force information to fit the analogy of the past. This forcing is something our intuitive brain desires because it makes the workload a little easier. Sean Ocker offers a strong example in his book, The Happiness Advantage. Ocker explains how the training of doctors in medical school includes a process of role-playing wherein, wherein aspiring doctors make diagnoses of imaginary patients. The play proceeds with the students reviewing a set of symptoms and medical history to come to a potential diagnosis. Repeated studies of these sessions observe that students struggle to let go of their initial diagnosis in these role-playing sessions. The would-be doctors are using their mental models to form an initial diagnosis, but then the intuitive brain is struggling to let go of that original conclusion even as new information is presented. This mental challenge is often called anchoring. In quotes. And the initial diagnosis is known as the anchoring point. In quotes. Of course, this makes sense because the intuitive brain is storing years of information and training around symptoms and diagnosis that would have been that sorry, that have been paired. Of course, this makes sense because the intuitive brain is storing years of information and training around symptoms and diagnoses that have been paired together through a series of mental models in the limbic system that the cortical brain is just itching to connect. But then why is it so hard to move from the anchoring point? What happens when something challenges these mental models? What happens when someone says, have you ever considered that you might be anchoring to a diagnosis? The challenges to these mental models feel mildly threatening. Why? Well, because our mental models are co-located with our emotions. More specifically, the social emotions including panic, which can be easily triggered. Our first response is one of concern for survival. After all, we initially created mental models to help us survive. Our second reaction is a memory of a past emotion or a similar experience which was likely another time that we felt this very same mental model was challenged and we had to fight for survival. And there's a great box here that says, whose mental model is it anyway? It can be hard to change one's mental model, but it can be even harder when you aren't sure who is really the target for change. Between 2013 and 2015, Victoria worked with teachers across a set of rural school districts on a technology initiative to revolutionize their teaching approach. These districts represented 233 schools across the United States. The goal was to deploy new technologies to help teachers bring more robust and dynamic information to their students. 
Her team was focused on how to get the teachers to adopt the emerging technology for productive learning. In order to the what what? In order to the learn the new tools. The fuck? In order in order to learn the new tools, I guess. In order to learn the new tools, teachers were trained by technology experts on the new resources. The program included a mix of technological devices, tablets, and software, online learning, interactive programs, web conferencing, that would connect the classroom to assets way beyond the county line. However, most found they got their real training from the students that helped them once the technology experts left. In general, the teachers were not receptive to change. On a scale of 1 to 5, 1 being resistant and 5 being adaptive, they were mostly a 2. Victoria knew because she surveyed them regularly. In total, her team evaluated 4,667 teachers across the school districts to determine their reaction to change. They found most of them struggled with a dramatic shift in approach to their standard way of teaching. This was a complete shift in mental model for the profession that they had been trained for and served in their entire life. Of course, eventually most of them moved toward adoption. Even the toughest critics found their way toward adoption over time. The really interesting part of the story comes from two districts in particular. These two districts not only adopted the new technology, but adopted the technology faster than the rest and really seemed to flourish under the approach. But why? It turns out that in these two districts, the mental model change came not just for the teachers, but for the entire community. In these two highly successful districts, there was an entire campaign across the community to introduce the technologically driven approach, discuss the program, and celebrate the success of the teachers and the school. These two communities were not just relying on the teachers to shift their mental models, the communities were shifting too. This support made it easier for the teachers to adopt the new technology and the communities moved toward more effective learning. This makes sense because we know that our intuitive brain handles both our memory and our emotions. Therefore, any challenge to a mental model will inherently link to our emotions and elicit an emotional reaction. In a group setting, this emotional reaction might be stronger or more pronounced because the limbic system specifically houses the social emotional response. So, to return to our doctor's role play from Sean Acker, when a budding doctor has their potential diagnosis challenged in a group setting after years of training, the challenge is hitting not just an emotional response, but an emotional response that is tied to that future doctor's entire social emotional history. Will the intuitive brain always be stuck? We come to the workplace with a lot on our mind. Our evolutionary past brought us to a comp brought us to a complex brain. Our evolutionary past brought us a complex brain with three parts that represent the instinctive, intuitive, and thoughtful components of ourselves. This is how the brain's evolution becomes central to our behavior in the workplace. Even today, as we work in organizations, we find that our work necessary for our survival in the economy is fundamentally linked to collaboration with others, where our emotions will be on full display. Our own limitations must be augmented by others known as our colleagues. However, we need to be able to collaborate with those colleagues to effectively do productive work. Many organizations need employees that solve problems with their rational brains and can collaborate with their colleagues to fill the gaps they are incapable of solving themselves. But that's not the brains we have and that's not the brains we build. Our brains are designed to rely on the intuitive side first and leverage the cognitive slash rational side for the more complex problems that rarely come. Our Western educational systems 
from an early age emphasize testing that leads to a route memorization that to, that leads to route route that leads to route memorization that leverages a part of the brain's design to become intuitive at the expense of rational problem solving and our collaborative nature is dulled by telling our colleagues not to bring their emotional side to work a fruitless request that is asking them to leave the very tools they need for collaboration at the door in parentheses, even if it means managers must learn to deal with some of the negative consequences that come along with those very tools. Just as Madeline's strategy for sales, our brain has been plodding along on its path for survival, but the goals have changed. No longer does society ask us to collaborate for the hunt. It demands much more. In fact, society expects the brain to keep up with evolution. We have taken 22 million years to get the brain we have today, and now we expect the same evolution every 22 milliseconds. But there is hope. First, organizations must recognize this conflict between our pace of organizational evolution and the evolution of the brain. While it may seem like an argument for an emotionally centered workplace, it is not. In the service economy, we depend on our workforce to represent us to the outside world. In the knowledge economy, we engage our workforce to collaboratively solve problems. In the interaction economy, we may be leveraging someone else's assets or employees, such as Airbnb or Uber. Or Uber. In all three cases, people are central to the success of the organization. I'll repeat that. In all three cases, people are central to the success of the organization. When people matter, the brain matters. I didn't include a little pun intended. No pun intended there. Okay, whatever. As Jerry Colonna notes, certain childhood belief systems are coming to the workplace whether we like it or not. It is really your choice whether you acknowledge them and work with them to ign or ignore them and fight them in an uphill battle. It is really your choice whether you acknowledge them and work with them or ignore them and fight them in an uphill battle. Second, we know the root of these challenges and we can manage them. While the brain is on a slow evolutionary path, each brain has its own challenges and individual reasons for getting stuck. Yet, we now know where these challenges form in the brain and why. They form because our limbic system converts our learning, emotions, and short-term memories into long-term memories that become our intuitive behavior. Once something is intuitive behavior, it is viewed by the outside world as being stuck. But what is done can be undone. The same part of the brain that learned these intuitive behaviors is responsible for learning new behaviors. Our limbic system can help us learn new behaviors combined with new emotions that will allow us to evolve. As through the process of long-term potentiation, our brains can make these into new intuitive behaviors. This is the biological process of becoming unstuck. As we will discuss more in chapter 3, it is easier said than done. Our tortoise brains will never catch the hare. Moore's law says that we can expect our technology to become twice as fast and half as, as expensive every year. Twice as fast, half as expensive. <sighs> well, I mean, corporate dictates what people get paid every year, so imagine that. I mean, until corporate cowboys come up and negotiate. Uh, we, we will see technology screwing over labor twice as fast with half the effort. That's something else. Our tortoise brains will never catch the hare. Moore's law says that we can expect our technology to become twice as fast and half as expensive every year. Some technology experts think we have outpaced this phenomenon with newer technologies. However, 
a globalized economy running 24 hours a day with petabytes of data is a far cry from the social hunting club of 20,000 years ago. The goal should not be to keep up, but rather to help organizations give the tortoise a nudge so that we don't get stuck along the way. I, that, that last paragraph, just a side note right here, this last paragraph beginning with our tortoise brains will never catch up is so fucking dense. Like to understand just that last sentence, the goal should not be to keep up, but rather to help organizations give the tortoise a nudge so that we don't get stuck along the way. That means, that means helping organizations. I mean, you can really only help organizations one of two ways, one of two ways, right? And that is through innovation or corruption. But both, both inevitably lead to the same thing, and that's change. Innovating or corrupting, because there are some shitty organizations where if you corrupt them, then the negative becomes a positive, and then there are some positive organizations where if you innovate them, the positive remains a positive, right? And ultimately, obviously, the mission is to, is, is to elicit, is to produce positive outcomes. Now, if we're helping organizations give the tortoise a nudge, the tortoise is the individual brain. It's the employee's brain. It's the executive's brain. It's the personal brain of the human, the individual human's brain. Now, if we're to help the organization give the individual a nudge, bro, you only do that by becoming a corporate cowboy. You do that by people at the top the elite becoming corporate cowboys, thinking ahead, thinking positively, moving the organizations in a positive manner towards innovation, not just sticking and standing by the status quo because organizations can be left behind. Organizations can become tortoises. Why do you think? I mean, the quote isn't that popular, but you can't expect peace by having slow moving whales contract with hungry sharks. That's why the individual will always move faster than an organization. Organizations by their very nature are slower moving. What makes them fast is the replaceability of individuals inside of the organizations. Like, uh, so far, this chapter has made it sound like an individual can expect a career with one organization. And that ain't true. That is no longer the norm. You, you don't expect to pension out from the current position you have now. Unless, unless you are such a valuable asset and the organization is, the organization's values and mission dovetails with your own professional goals that it becomes worthwhile to, to even stick around for 20 or 25 years. Okay, well, here's some practical exercises in the book. Reflect, identify your mental models. We all use mental models to navigate the world. They are useful for reducing the amount of time we spend processing information to make decisions and react to the stimuli thrown at us. Map the decision Backwards, take an important organizational decision you are about to make, write down the full logic for the direction and the way we tend to think about it, establish decision criteria, generate alternatives, evaluate alternatives, select the best alternative. Then try working through the process backwards. Write the problem on the left-hand side of the page and the decision on the right-hand side of the page. Work backward through this process. This time focusing on the sam on the on the what? On the sum of the unseen constraints. Focusing on some of the unseen constraints of your decision. Yeah, this this book has typographical and grammatical errors. I will try to fix them as I go along, but I don't guarantee that uh, you know me me proofreading it the one time, having never read the book, reading it my first time as an audio book to you, the listener. It's going to be perfect. I don't guarantee that. I don't guarantee it'll perfection. 
what are the potential ethical challenges associated with this decision? What are the organizational constraints on this decision? What possible basics, biases, I'm sorry, what possible biases do I bring to this decision? Were there options that I quickly eliminated? Why? Did I eliminate options because I know how they would be responded to within the organization? Did I eliminate options because of the financial constraints? Did I eliminate options because of some of the other decision makers and how they would respond to the options? If so, you might be identifying some of the mental models you applied to the decision. Identify their mental model. This is a way to identify mental models in yourself by focusing on mental models in others. It is a bit of a game. You can sit in your organization and listen effectively to how others are forming mental models. It may help you determine what mental models you are developing. Watch how others are formulating their questions. See how they bring together pieces of information. What filters do they apply? How often do you hear them apply analogies to past work? Have you ever used the same filters or the same analogies? If so, you are using that mental model too. Apply. 10 common mental model errors. We often get stuck repeatedly using mental models to make decisions to our own limitation. These errors come in several different forms, but some of the most common forms are in table 2-2. What is your most common mental model error? And table 2-2 is next, and actually uh, it's titled Common Mental Model Errors. Many of these errors are cited in an important piece from 1998 by a Mr. John S. Hammond, Ralph L. Keeney, and Howard Reifa. It's called The Hidden Traps in Decision Making. That came out of the Harvard Business Review. Confirming evidence. We tend to look for reasons to support what we would like to happen. Sunk cost. We tend to make choices in a way that justifies past choices and past resource commitment. Status quo. We tend to favor decisions that perpetuate what is already happening. Anchoring. We give disproportionate weight to the first information we receive. Overconfidence. We tend to believe strongly in the accuracy of our predictions. Framing. We make our choice based on the way the problem is set up for us. Gain framing. We are risk averse when the issue is framed in terms of what we may gain from a situation. Loss framing. We are risk seeking when the issue is framed in terms of what we may lose from a situation. Reference point framing. We shift the point of orientation to evoke different possible outcomes. Implicit bias. We have underlying factors or assumptions that skew our viewpoints of a subject. Apply. Your emotional profile. We use emotional traps just like mental models. The emotional traps seek, sorry, the emotional traps speak to our personality and how others view us in the workplace. Dr. John Gottman evolved Jacques Pans, Pan, Panceps. Jacques Pansex. Fucking. Dr. John Gottman evolved Jacques Panse, Panceps. Panceps. Seven emotional systems. Dr. John Gottman evolved Jacques Panceps. Seven emotional systems into a set of personas. Undoubtedly, as you read the seven emotional systems, you could not help but think about how these, as you read, oh, undoubtedly, as you read the seven emotional systems, you could not help but think about how these might apply to you and the people around you. In truth, no one system dominates a single person, but Gottman's approach allows for an understanding of these roles at the extremes, both overuse and underuse of a personified form, in a personified form. There is the jester. Let's see here. There is. And now we apply. Your emotional profile. 
We use emotional traps just like mental models. The emotional traps speak to our personality and how others view us in the workplace. Dr. John Gottman evolved Jack Pank Sep's seven emotional systems into a set of personas. Undoubtedly, as you read the seven emotional systems, you could not help but think about how these might apply to you and the people around you. In truth, no one system dominates a single person, but Gottman's approach allows for an understanding of these roles at the extremes, both overuse and underuse, in a personified form. The jester, the one who emphasizes the fun and play in life by pursuing leisure and recreation over all else. Too much use of this persona can lead to silliness. Too little can lead to lethargy and ultimately challenges like depression. The sensualist. The core characteristics of this persona are attraction and lust. Too much of this character could lead to sexual risk-taking and challenges in the workplace like sexual harassment. Too little use of this persona leads to aversion and depression. Notice how these uh, too little use of any of these lead to depression. <laughs> the nest builder, a persona that desires affiliation and care from others, both an overactivation and underactivation of this character can lead to anxiety with a loss of personal boundaries when overactivated and a sense of loss when underactivated. Loss like depression. The commander in chief, a controlling persona that rages through power and can lead to aggression and rage. The right balance here will demonstrate confidence. However, too much of the persona quickly leads to anger, and too little will quickly dissipate to passivity and frustration. The Explorer, a person that is seeking for answers and new experiences with goal setting and curiosity. Too much of this persona can lead to obsessive behavior and overwork, while too little can lead to boredom and restlessness. The Energy Czar, a health-conscious persona on the surface that might be governing their own concerns of panic. With balance, this persona manages energy effectively with good balance of exercise, diet, and relaxation. However, the same overactive behaviors might lead to shame and guilt, while underactive versions of the persona might lead to fatigue, weakened immunity, and depression. <laughs> the sentry. This persona is always on guard and can be quite fearful of the world around. Overactivation of this character can lead to phobias and paranoia, while an underactivation can lead to carelessness and risk-taking. So here's a possible group activity. Act them inside out. Disney's Disney Pixar's 2015 film Inside Out tells a story of how our emotions work together to govern the body of one growing girl, Riley. We watch as Riley's personified emotions react in their own way to major changes in her life. If you want to help your colleagues understand how these different emotions influence the workplace and support perspective taking, do some role playing with your colleagues. Try bringing the emotions from the inside out. Pick a common setting at work and ask your team members to play the seven different emotional systems as you discuss a common organizational challenge. This could be a light topic as a form of team building, or it could be a light approach to break through on wicked problems the team has been struggling to address. With a note, be careful who you select for the sensualist. This one should not be overplayed. <laughs> okay. And that concludes, that concludes chapter two of Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss by Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh, publisher, Productivity Press, 2022. 
narrated by yours truly, Alex, of the Corporate Cowboys podcast, powered by Incorporating Associates. You want to keep this operation non-for-profit? By all means, do that. You can subscribe on Patreon, as well as shoot us a donation. There are links available in the bio somewhere. You can find them. It's a Venmo, a Cash App, and a PayPal. Thank you. Have a nice one.